All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is Randy Alper with the California Air Resources Board. Hopefully, you're here today to join us for the 521.9 Compliance Options and Reporting Requirements. Again, my name is Randy Alper, and uh, with me today is Katie King, a coworker of mine who's also going to be presenting today. You want to say hi, Katie? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I guess I should have asked before we got started whether or not anybody can hear us. So uh, can somebody respond in the questions dialog box that the audio is coming across all right? Uh, we'll see if we're, we're on, on tap today for that. Uh, all right, good. We got a couple of people responding. Fantastic. Good deal. So that was one of the administrative things that I usually do right off the bat. And there are a couple more we need to take care of before I can get into the material. Uh, first of all, on the first slide, you have both my email and Katie's email. We'll probably put that in the questions dialog box as we go through the presentation, because typically what's going to happen is people will send us emails after the class, which is fine. Two reasons people send us emails uh, are, are, number one, they want a copy of the handout. And the handout, either Katie and I will email you a handout anytime you want. However, it is downloadable right now during this presentation. On the right hand side, you should have part of the dialog box that says handouts one of five. The handout for this class is included in a PDF form on that section of the dialog box and you can download it at any point during the presentation. If you don't feel like doing that or if it doesn't work for you, that's fine. Uh, we will email to you if you request it. But once the webinar is over, you won't have access to that download anymore. So do it while you have access and we're all good. The second reason people email us is because they want to, I guess, review the presentation, which is why we always record each of our webinars and you will have the ability to watch this again if you like. It uh, does require us to send you a link that goes to GoToMeeting where they store the file. That file isn't immediately available after one of our classes. It has to take a couple of hours for them to go through some, I don't know what they do with it, but basically it transforms it from what they recorded into, into an MP4. So you'll be able to watch that. But again, send us an email if you're interested in that. And tomorrow, either I or Katie will probably email you back with that link. All right. So, uh, anything, oh, uh, the last administrative thing that I want to talk about, we've kind of already hit on, but I want to make sure I cover it before we get going. And that is dealing with questions. During the presentation, at first I'm going to be doing the, the presentation and then uh, right after I get done talking about advanced clean trucks, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Katie. Whoever's not presenting is going to be manning the questions dialog box and that is where you, the audience, would put your questions in uh, during the presentation if you have a question about what's being uh, talked about. Uh, whoever's manning that, either I or Katie, will try and answer the question for you and for the class using that question dialog box. Occasionally, one of us will have to stop the presenter to read the question out loud and have that question answered by the presenter. Uh, that may happen once or twice during this presentation, but just remember that while we're going through this, uh, we would like you very much if you have questions to put them in that dialog box so that we can answer them uh, as we go through the material. Okay. Let's see here. Now, the topics for today's presentation are shown here. I will be covering the truck and bus regulation with all the applicability, flexibility, options, reporting, and then I will be going through one of our newest regulations here at the Air Resources Board, Advanced Clean Trucks. If you don't know what that is, don't worry. Uh, I, this is just a primer. There's more information, but I will uh, give you some context or links that you can follow later on. Then I'm going to turn it over to Katie, and she's going to be doing the enforcement overview, which includes the PSIP program as well as SB1, and she'll finish up with the greenhouse gas regulation. This whole thing should take us anywhere from two hours to maybe two and a half. It's a little different every time because of questions, and I guess I remember things periodically that I didn't say before or something like that, but I'm roughly about two hours. Let's go through the truck and bus regulation. And the first thing I want to make sure everybody in this audience is aware is who actually falls under this regulation. Uh, Katie and I both noticed that there were some public agency people in the audience today. 
That would be people who work for county agencies or city agencies or state agencies or a public or private utility. Um, I specifically on this slide put down that those type of agencies do not fall under the truck and bus rule. Because we had a regulation that predates truck and bus called the public agency and private utility fleet rule, those type of vehicles are under that regulation. So if you have questions about that, you certainly can ask uh, during this presentation or send either us an email. But I would tell you that we have a whole presentation for public agencies. It's called MS 522, and we specifically go over that PAU regulation as well as others. For the truck and bus rule, it's important for you to understand that if you operate a uh, commercial or federal fleet, and a fleet under this rule is even considered one vehicle, and you operate this in California, it's diesel or any type of diesel fuel, and the vehicle has a gross weight of over 14,000 pounds, so that would be 14,001 and greater, then chances are your vehicle falls under this regulation. Public and private school buses also fall under this rule. It's kind of a quirk that they do. They were supposed to be under the, the public agency rule, but um, it didn't happen, so they got shunted into this one. If you happen to have public or, or private school buses, uh, we can talk offline about what your requirements are because they're not identical to what I'm gonna show you here today and two-engine street sweepers also fall under this regulation as long as it's not owned by a public agency. Public agency two-engine street sweepers will fall under that public agency rule. All right, your responsibility if you are one of the above described entities. Uh, if you own a vehicle, as I described, and again, it's a diesel on-road commercial vehicle that is uh, in California and over 14,000 pounds. If you own that vehicle, if you lease or rent a vehicle like that, there are requirements for that vehicle to be in compliance with this regulation. And we're going to make you responsible for that. Uh, if the lease or rent thing, it really has to be specified in the contract whether or not you're gonna be responsible, but it is possible. If you sell a vehicle that falls under this regulation, we do not make anybody sell in vehicles, bring those vehicles up to, up to date with the compliance. But there is a paragraph of text that we require you to include on your sales documentation that literally warns the person who's purchasing the vehicle about our regulation. And then the California-based brokers and dispatchers, and I gotta check something, yeah, it's okay, I'll show you sales disclosure in just a minute. California-based brokers and dispatchers, uh, these are people who don't typically own trucks. They broker the use or dispatch trucks that are owned by other people. Uh, and their responsibility for compliance is not necessarily making their vehicles compliant. Their responsibility is for only hiring those vehicles that they know to be compliant. So, uh, not hiring or not hiring non-compliant uh, vehicles to do their work. Uh, now there's a whole. Uh, uh, oh God, what is it? There's a whole advisory available for you if you happen to be in the hiring of other people's trucks to do your work that will tell you what you have to do in order to actually comply with this regulation. Uh, one of the easiest ways, and I'll show you this a little bit later, is to ask for something called a certificate of reported compliance. If you do that, then generally speaking, the, the Air Resources Board is going to see that you've done your due diligence in hiring compliant fleets. Let's talk about the sales disclosure. So the sales disclosure is shown there on the bottom of this slide. Now there are multiple sales disclosures, so you need to make sure you get the right one. This particular one is the one that's specific to just the truck and bus regulation. There is another one that is specific to just the off-road regulation, and still a third one that is specific to just portable equipment. And there's also a fourth uh, paragraph that actually encapsulates the requirements of all three of those regulations. We don't include it here because we don't talk about the other two regulations in this class. But if you want that language, we certainly can get it to you. As far as the sales disclosure is concerned though, when you sell a vehicle that's in California to somebody that you know is gonna operate it in the state of California, <clears throat> we expect you and require you to include that paragraph 
uh, on the sales paperwork. So the bill of sale, the contracts, whatever it is, that paragraph has to be there. And you're supposed to maintain those records for three years. Now, this is not something that will ever come up during an inspection. This is something that actually would be asked for if there happened to be an audit of your fleet. All right. There are always exclusions to every rule, and this one is no different. Uh, most emergency use and emergency vehicles are exempt from our regulations. One of the regulations that uh, Katie is going to talk about, the PSIP regulation later on, does not exempt emergency vehicles, but they are exempt from truck and bus. So are military tactical, personal use motorhomes, and personal use pickup trucks, as long as they're not like that big one right there. So there is a little bit of a problem here with personal use pickup trucks. Um, generally speaking, if you look at most of our rules, uh, personal use anything would be exempt because these are these regulations are typically going to be dealing with commercial use. Uh, however, in the truck and bus rule, it does include personal use pickup trucks if they're beyond a certain size. So if you happen to have one of these souped up pickups that is over 19,500 pounds, and my friends, that is a large pickup truck, uh, you would have a requirement. It would be under this regulation. It also does create a problem because because personal use pickup trucks are included in this regulation at all, when we go to try and determine whether or not a vehicle is in compliance or not by using DMV data, we sometimes get pickup trucks that should not be under the regulation, but they're included in the information we're getting. See, here's how it happens. Because this rule covers everything over 14,000 pounds, if you happen to have a personal use pickup truck that is over 14,000 pounds, but under nine, under or equal to 19.5, your data is going to be included in the DMV information when we ask for commercial vehicles, diesel vehicles in the state of California. First of all, you should, you should be aware that all pickup trucks are des designated as commercial vehicles, so they're in there. And if it's over 14,000 pounds, it's going to be in there as well. And we have no way of knowing that that is one of these vehicles that should be exempt. So I believe on the next page, I'm gonna show you a, uh, a, a website where you can input the information about your personal use pickup truck if it happens to be one of these ones that's kind of caught in that middle area. Historic vehicles are exempt. We, uh, we do uh, require that they are registered with DMV as historic vehicles. And if you're wondering what kind of truck that is, there's a nice picture of a show vehicle right there, all chromed up and shiny. Those vehicles also have uh, CHP requirements. Uh, they're not allowed to carry uh, or tow any kind of um, materials. They're, they're very specific on what they can do. So we don't include them in this regulation. And if your vehicle is subject to another in-use regulation, one of the reasons I mentioned the whole public agency thing is because there are some vehicles owned by public agencies that you know look, sound, act, feel, taste just like the ones in this rule. But because they're under the public agency rule, they are not under this regulation. We don't cover twice with the same vehicle, two different regulations. There are other regulations that have that same kind of functionality. We've got a rule that call, that's called the dredge truck regulation. So it would be commercial use trucks that look, taste, and feel just like the ones in this rule, except they're used specifically to haul containers to and from ports or rail yards. And because those trucks are in that rule, they are not under this regulation. I hope everybody got that, all right? And finally, if you have a two engine vehicle, this would be a vehicle that has a main drive engine that provides the motive force, and then a secondary engine used for some other power production purpose, but the, the secondary engine doesn't provide any, any motive force. Those are called two engine vehicles, and they fall, they, they create a problem for us because that secondary engine is called portable, and there's a whole set of regulations that deal nothing with that. We're not going to discuss that anymore in this class, but you should be aware that those two engine vehicles are generally going to be subject to the off-road regulation. Here is the exempt diesel vehicle reporting system that I mentioned dealing with the pickup trucks. So if you, again, if you have a personal use pickup truck that is diesel, and it's on road, obviously, uh, that is over 14,000 pounds, but you do not use it for commercial purposes. You have the ability to report that information into the system. And if we get all the correct information, 
we will uh, send a little note to DMV and tag your vehicle is not under our rule. Uh, you ought to be aware also that in order for it to qualify, the vehicle has to have a standard pickup bed. It can't have any other kind of weird thing like a service truck bed or a Tommy lift or uh, stake side flatbeds, things like that. All those are commercial use type trucks when they have that kind of thing. So this exemption is strictly for those commercial or those non-commercial pickup trucks. All right, so that's the preamble. Let's get into the actual requirements. And uh, in order for us to do that, though, we do have to understand that this rule also categorizes all the vehicles under it into one of two classes. You're either considered, the truck is either considered light or heavy. The light trucks are anything that's over 14,000 pounds, but less than or equal to 26,000 pounds. And the heavy trucks are anything over 26,000 pounds. If you want to do that to industry standard classes, the light trucks would be class four, five, and six, and the heavy trucks would be class seven and eight. You need to know that information before I or anybody can tell you what your requirements are because of the, the, the requirements this rule are broken into those two categories. Now, where do you get that information? The gross vehicle weight rating is something that uh, every truck is legally required to have stamped on it somewhere. It's put there by the manufacturer of the truck, not the engine. And it's only put there after the truck is constructed. So when it's put together, all the various parts that make up a truck, the manufacturer will put a tag that you see like this on the left-hand side that lists a lot of different weights. The only one that makes any difference to an ARB inspector or an ARB auditor or someone who's helping you with your reporting is going to be the one that says gross weight or gross vehicle weight rating. That's not something that you can easily change. In fact, really the only way to change that number is to have the truck modified by either removing or adding an axle so you can train, change the total amount of or maximum weight that that thing can carry when it's fully loaded. In any case, you need that number to determine where you fit. The second number that you will need is the model year of your engine. For on-road vehicles, all engines are certified to a model year standard by federal EPA. Now that model year standard is going to be comparable to either, uh, well, for compliance purposes, either a 2007 or newer model year engine or a 2010 or newer model year engine. If you have older ones, don't worry, they fit in too, but those are the two basic model year requirements. Uh, where do you get that information? This has been confusing for a lot of people, but there is a place that has been around for a long time that every engine is supposed to have available uh, for you to look at as well as for an enforcement person to look at, and that's a tag called the emission control label. You can see an example of one right here on the bottom of the slide here on the right-hand side. The emission control label is required by federal EPA, and it's a tag that lists not only the model year of the engine, but also the family name of the engine and any equipment that was put on this engine at the factory to comply with federal emission standards. This, is, this tag is supposed to be somewhere on the engine. Uh, and in fact, unfortunately, if you want to know the single most common citation that ARB inspectors write on an annual basis, it's for missing or illegible emission control labels. Because a lot of the time when we're doing our inspections, well, every time we do our inspection, we look for that tag because we can't do enforcement without it. But when we're looking, we many times cannot find it. If we can't find it, or if it's destroyed in some way that makes it un unable for us to read, then there is a citation associated with that. It's a fix-it ticket. You've got to get it replaced and repaired. But it's uh, it's been a problem for quite some time for people to keep those things and in a legible form. Anyway, that's where you get the information. Uh, you may be thinking, well, it's gotta be in my, uh, I don't know, the, the information, the paperwork that I got from you know the, the dealership, and not necessarily. The paperwork from the dealership is probably gonna e either be generalized or it's probably gonna list the model year of the vehicle itself. And the model year of the vehicle is not necessarily the same as the model year of the engine. In fact, they're usually different. And more than often, more often than not, I should say, the model year of the engine is one year or more behind the model year of the truck. So it's important that you get this off the emission control label. Once you have those two pieces of information, you can then look at what your requirement is. If you made a determination 
that the truck was in the light class. So it's a class four, five, or six. Then you would look at this chart to get your basic requirement. And the basic requirement shown in this chart is pretty simple as far as how to read this chart. People are gonna argue with me about how simple it is to actually do, and I get that. But let's read what the chart says. So on this chart, for lighter trucks, you on the left-hand column, you find the model year of your engine. And then on the right-hand column, you find a date. And on that date, that engine of that model year is no longer legal to operate in the state of California unless you have updated it to be equivalent to a 2010 model year engine. Now, without going into a long discussion of what that means, for most of you, it means that you're going to have to repower the engine if you want to keep the same truck. Because you, there is no way to put a retrofit on an existing engine to bring it up to 2010 standards. There are too many different changes that happened with that engine, and it's it has to be rebuilt, repowered, actually. So the old engine's gone and the new engine's coming in. That's not feasible for most people who operate this size of truck, because I can tell you from my own experience, uh, I've talked to many dealerships who do this and a lot of uh, mechanics that have done it on their own. To repower a vehicle to a 2010 emission standard engine, you're going to spend anywhere from a low of, say, $25,000 to a high of seventy dollars or $100,000. I happen to know a dealership down in the Ventura area that they don't even start talking to you about repowering uh, anything less than $100,000. So it's not something you're going to do most of the time. So what does that leave you as far as options? I, I'll give you an example. If you happen to have a model year engine in the light class that is 2004 through 2006, then in less than six months, that vehicle is going to be illegal to operate in the state of California. Your choices are to repowered at that point or before that point, uh, or you could drop it down to low use, which I'll talk about more later. Uh, the other options are to retire it or to replace it, to sell it, to get rid of it. Those are really the only things you can do with it. Now, I do know some people that are have been dropping these kind of vehicles into low use and putting them to other purposes. I know a gentleman up in the Ukiah area who started his own company doing water tenders for Cal Fire, and he owns like 40 of these kind of trucks, and puts them all in their low use, and uses the emergency use exemption to get them there. So there's lots of different places these trucks can go, and they still can be used for certain things. But if you're not going down one of those paths, then your choices are to repower, replace, retire, or drop it into low use. For the heavy trucks, there's a similar kind of chart. It looks similar, except it's got one additional column. And that column was put there because for the heavier vehicles, we required them to be filtered with retrofit diesel particulate filters prior to the date they had to be turned over to 2010 engines. So you had a double requirement here. You read it the same way. Let's go with our 2004 engine right there. Um, that's down on, what is that, the fourth row down. Uh, that had to have a filtration system installed on it by January 1st of 2013. And before the end of this year, if they want to hold on to that same truck, they would, whoever owns that would have to update the engine to a 2010 emission standard engine. They'd have to repower. The same options apply. You can drop it down to low use, you can replace it, you can retire it. Any one of those things is acceptable. Now, these two charts that I just showed you are the basic compliance model year schedules or model year compliance schedules. If your vehicle falls within the parameters outlined by these charts, then your vehicle's compliant and you do not have to report to us. It is compliant. Now, you may have some issues with DMV if it's an older vehicle, but there are ways to get past that where you don't necessarily still have to report. Uh, you, it's just a demonstration that you're in compliance. Okay. Randy, we actually had a good question. Um, okay. So somebody was asking if they retire and red tag a vehicle um, if and it's still on their site, if that's considered in compliance. So with this regulation, if it's registered with the DMV, you're still going to run into some issues unless you change the way it's registered with the DMV because our systems communicate and it's still going to get flagged as a non-compliant truck. Yeah, so there's one thing I'd like to add to that. When they say red tag, I'm assuming they're talking about putting it non-op. Okay. All right. A non-op is a form of DMV registration. And unfortunately, there is no non-op in this regulation. It's low use. 
So if you had a vehicle like that that you legally still own and it's on the back lot because you're not using it anymore, you should list it as low use. Even if it doesn't put any miles on it, it's still going to get caught up, as Katie said, unless you do something like that. Was that the only question, Katie? Yeah. Okay. All right, then let's dig into something called flexibility options. Flexibility options are something that has been part of this rule from the very beginning. Uh, it's one of the things that have made this rule so complicated for people to understand because the, the flexibility options were inserted into this rule from the very beginning. We added some, we changed some. We did lots of different things with flexibility options, but they were all designed to try and help specific types of vehicles or fleets have more time to comply with this regulation. In order to use a flexibility option, you do you did have to opt into them, and you did have to do did have to report. See, our field representatives, like the one you see in the picture there, they look at the vehicle, and the very first thing they do is look at one of those two charts. Once they determine the gross weight and the model year of the engine, then they look at those two charts. If it's in compliance with those two charts, you're good to go. If it's not, then they have to look into the reporting system to, to understand what would make it legal for that vehicle to be on the road. And what could make it legal is you opting into a flexibility option. You have to tell us you're doing that, otherwise we have no idea that's what you're trying to do. It's not good enough to just say, I don't use the vehicle. There are reporting requirements if you have a vehicle like that, and, and they, they include a flexibility option as we're talking about. The flexibility options uh, mostly have gone away as a function of this rule being imp the implementation schedule of the rule. Uh, by 2018, most of the flexibility options timed out and they don't exist anymore. There are a few that I'm going to talk about in just a minute, but before I can get there, I do have to talk about something that created a, a pretty significant change in the regulation. And that was a, a lawsuit that happened back in 2014. In 2014, our agency made some major amendments to this regulation. Uh, if you're wondering why we did that, we were trying to actually make it more easy or easier for people who were having trouble to comply with the rule. So we added extensions and we added more flexibility options and we, we did a lot of stuff. Unfortunately, we were sued immediately after we adopted the changes by a company called Lawson Trucking in conjunction with the California Trucking Association. Uh, now, that, that lawsuit was filed back at the end of 2014, and by early 2015, we had been told by the administrative law judge that we lost. Uh, so we filed an appeal, and the appeal took us all the way out to uh, 2018, and then 2018, the administrative law judge came back and said we lost again. So there is no more appeal for this. We're actually past the point where we could do that anyway. And the, the reason I'm bringing it up now is because, for the most part, it, it didn't do anything to the people that took advantage of the changes we made, but there are a few uh, components, few flexibilities that had some major issues because of this lawsuit. And we're gonna talk about those right now. The flexibility options that had the most impact were these shown here. And I'll go through them one at a time just so you, you get the feel for what the, the problems have been. The first was dealing with something called a heavy crane. Now, the flexibility for heavy cranes is still in existence. It was a, um, a, a provision that was added to the rule in 2014. It did not exist prior to then. And it, it allowed for a specific type of on-road crane to be able to, the owners of that, to fall into a schedule that was different than anybody else's. They didn't have to filter. They had to convert to 2010 engines and they had to do it on a schedule that allowed them to go all the way out until 2027 or 2028. Uh, because it was not, in the rule prior to 2014, the lawsuit negated it or nullified it. Uh, we couldn't let that happen. So what we did is we took the language of this provision and we inserted it into another regulation that was being updated. And that happened to be the solid waste collection vehicle rule. So that's where this provision is. And it just, it makes an interesting dichotomy of this for this requirement because these are on-road trucks, but they fall under the solid waste collection rule. Uh, you, if you own one of these trucks and you're in this, you know you're in it, you, you know you're following this, it, uh, you, you should really see no difference between what it was before and what it is now because you still have to report using the same reporting system. But it is something that was 
pretty significant when you talk about the regulatory change accorded by that lawsuit. The next one, which is more generally applicable and had some impacts, uh, is the ag, uh, ag vehicle requirements or the ag extension. This was a very widely used provision and still is. It was the single most useful provision for anyone that was operating the, the correct type of vehicle in the state of California. It allowed for more miles for a longer period of time without doing anything to the truck itself uh, than any other provision in the rule. In this case, it was affected by the lawsuit because in 2019, uh, it took away 5,000 miles of operation for anybody that was in the provision itself. At this point, 2020 through 2023, there is really no difference between what the 2014 amendments uh, allowed and what the old regulation allowed. Uh, anybody that falls under the ag mileage uh, provision has 10,000 miles or less of operation per year until 2023. At that point, you can drop it down to low use, but you're gonna be required to have a 2010 engine for any other vehicle in your fleet. All right, NOx exempt areas. This was a very interesting the way it got put in here because you see that map right there it shows you different shaded parts of our state. If you happen to live and work in the darker shaded areas, and that's where your truck that fell under this rule existed, uh, because those areas already meet and, and were meeting federal NOx emission standards, uh, we gave them kind of a bump in this rule. By that I mean, so since we don't need any NOx improvement in those areas, we're not going to require that anybody that stays in those areas ever update their truck to a 2010 engine, because that's what the 2010 engine does, is it, it basically, the 20, 2007 engine is mainly particulate matter control, and then the 2010 engine adds a NOx control element. So anybody that lives and works in the dark green areas doesn't have to do anything other than have a filter on their truck. They don't have to have 2010 engines. If you live and work in those areas, fantastic. I hope you take advantage of this. This provision is supposed to be around forever. Um, you're, if you're wondering why there are lighter shade areas, well, that's why I'm talking about here, because in the 2014 amendments, we added those areas, but because we lost that lawsuit, those areas have since been dropped and they're no longer part of the provision. All right, uh, extended use of PM filters and retrofits. Two things going on here. Uh, one was that we we originally had a provision in the rule that would allow anybody who filtered every truck that they had prior to 2014 to operate that fleet of vehicles to 2023, regardless of what the model year the engines were. Uh, so they would basically ignore the schedules that I showed you. 2014, we took away the requirement that there'd be the entire fleet, and then when the lawsuit happened, that came back. So now, if you if you want an extension for one of your older trucks out till 2023, using this extended uh, retrofit uh, provision, the only way you're going to get it is if you are the one that put the filter on, you filtered your entire fleet prior to 2014, and you still own the truck. It's not transferable by that. I mean, you can't sell it to somebody and they take advantage of that. So uh, it is what it is, uh, and most of the time, the people that fall under this exclusion are gonna be owner operators that, that uh, had a filter on prior to that point. All right, let's go through low use. So low use has, is, was, will be perhaps the, the, the most commonly used provision or exception in this regulation. And it's truly an exemption from the rule, which means that if you can qualify for the low use and maintain that limited number of miles on an annual basis, then you never have to add a filter to your truck. You never have to update it to 2010 engine. You keep it essentially the same way it was built. Uh, you just have to limit your miles. The reason it's being discussed here is because the low use was modified in 2014 we used to have only one limitation, and that was no more than 1,000 miles in California. You could drive anywhere outside the state you wanted, but you just couldn't drive more than 1,000 in California. 2014, we added a secondary exception that allowed for up to 5,000 miles total, and lots of people took advantage of that. The lawsuit actually took it away a year earlier than it was supposed to, and so uh, we're at the 1,000 miles right now, and that's what it's gonna be for as long as there's a regulation, and, and that's, forever basically uh so if you if you want to do low use you you can 
you just have to keep the vehicle under a thousand miles per year and you have to limit your stationary hours if it has a stationary uh, operation to less than 100 hours per year. All right, uh, in order for this to function, just any of these flexibilities, they do require reporting and they don't require it once, they require annual reporting. You can get more information here at this website. Uh, this is actually a bit updated and it's uh, fantastic as far as getting information. One thing that Katie and I were talking about prior to the session was the fact that if you go uh, on this page here, you can see on the bottom right, it says training and events. If you click on there, there will be links to videos of recorded webinars. So you don't necessarily have to wait for us to send you a link because we have them there as well. And I have mentioned reporting, so let's get into that and discuss what it is. Reporting, as I originally said when I was talking about the two schedules that I showed you, is not required unless you are out of compliance for some reason with those two schedules. Uh, if you do need to report, then you have to report by Jan in January of each year. So you should be in the system now, and every January you've got to come in and update your fleet. If you make changes to your fleet during the year, that's fine. Nobody's stopping anybody from doing that, but you're going to want to come into the system and update your changes within 30 days. Now, you might think, well, why don't I, if I have to come in January, why don't I just make all my updates then? That's fine. You can do that. The biggest issue that we've had with that is that the field operation part of our enforcement division, they when they go out into the field, they take a download of the current trucker's database uh, and they use that information uh, to determine compliance. If you haven't updated your fleet in the system, they may have an older picture of what your fleet actually is supposed to be, and there could be some compliance issues related to that. So you're gonna wanna make sure if you, if you have the time and you really wanna stay up on it, that you update that every 30 days. Now, it is um, an online system called Truckers. That's an acronym that's short for the Truck Regulation Upload Compliance and Reporting System. That's a mouthful. Uh, and it requires a lot of information. Uh, if you have questions related to this, this reporting system, there is an email for staff that handle it as well. Uh, if you don't like computers, we also have paper forms available for reporting. This is what the login or account creation screen looks like. Now, I'm gonna go back a few slides because I wanna show you something here. Up at the very top right-hand side under the uh, URL, you can see highlighted in yellow the word truckers, T-R-U-C-R-S. That is a link that will take you directly to this page. Now, here, as I said, you can create an account here. If you have an existing account, you can log in here. If you forgot your username and or password, there is a way to possibly recover that here. If you need more information about reporting or about the regulation, we have resources here as well quick links to different pieces of information that might be helpful. Once you log in, you should get to a place that looks somewhat like this. It's uh, the account home. It's, it'll show you your trucker's ID, which is the number that we generated to associate it to your fleet. It will have the company name or the name of the fleet, and it will have links that say uh, tabs at the top. I've got an arrow pointing to account settings. And I've also got links that say viewer updates, delete fleet, or check status. Those should be present anytime you are looking at this. Now, as far as account settings are concerned, I wanna show you this because this is where you can change the contact information associated with this account, i.e. the name or the phone number or the email associated with the account. You can also change your password here if you need to. There is no way to change the account username. If that's something that you set up at the very beginning and that is not changeable once it's been set up. When you go to the, um, the the account, well, the message center, uh, it's going to show you this page, which gives you updates on what's going on with truckers, if there's anything new that you need to be aware of. It's also gonna give you these tabs that I've kind of highlighted with the red markers or the red arrows. Uh, again, company info, vehicle info, compliance status. They should be there. Now, if you click on vehicle info, then you're gonna get more tabs and you're gonna get lots of information. The vehicle info tab is the one where you can actually see the fleet as you've reported it. This particular fleet has eight trucks that we can see on the screen. 
Each row represents a different truck. Now you can edit each individual row, which means you're editing the information of that particular truck. On an annual basis, if you're coming in to report simply your uh, mileage, then you do get here, but you can go straight to the odometer readings tab, which I have circled on this slide, and that's where you would enter. The only vehicles that will show up on that tab are the ones that are using low use options. So you can enter all your mileage on that tab specifically, and then you don't have to do anything else with this reporting system. A couple of things I'd like to say about the odometer reading tab. I think I need to include a picture of that somewhere. I don't have it here today, but that tab has several different places to put information. It'll have your um, your, the date that you enter the odometer reading for each vehicle, it'll have the current uh, odometer reading, which is the, the one that was taken on that date, uh, and it'll have a couple of other places to put mileage. The other places, one is for out-of-state miles and one is for emergency use. Because out-of-state miles, remember the limitation for low use doesn't include many miles out-of-state. So if you do out-of-state driving with this vehicle that you're claiming low use, you're going to want to track how many miles you go out of state because that could that will affect your ability to keep the low use option if you drive a lot of miles outside the state and the emergency use if you happen to be doing something in, in an emergency um, situation working for a government agency and under contract like with somebody like cal fire for water tendering like my friend i was talking about um, that that data has to be logged so that we can calculate whether or not you actually stayed below the thousand miles per year of non-emergency in-state miles. Um, one cautionary tale or statement I would like to burn into everybody's mind, please do not enter any information on the odometer readings tab for any vehicle until you have done basic math. And by basic math, if you have multiple numbers you need to put in there, you need to, to subtract this year's or last year's odometer reading from this year's odometer reading before you type anything in to make sure you're not over the limitation. Now, how you handle that once you make that math calculation is entirely up to you, but I'm telling you, as soon as you type that number in, the system records it and you're in a world of hurt trying to stay with that if it went over a thousand miles. In any case, there's lots of information here on this screen that I'd like to go over besides the tabs. Uh, again, we see the, uh, the company info, message center, account home, and the compliance status. So I'm going to show you the compliance status in just a minute. But before we get there, one of the things that often happens is I get calls from people, especially during the reporting period, who uh, are reporting or updating their fleets, and they can't figure out why the system is saying that they're not compliant or that they're, they're not done reporting. So a couple of columns here to look at. On the far right hand side, there's a column that says reporting complete and there'll be either a Y or an N. If there is an N, that means that you're missing information. It doesn't necessarily require that you have a Y there in order to be compliant, but you have missing information and a good chunk of the time that missing information is what could be making your fleet show up as non-compliant. The column right next to it where it says PM filter uh, or exemption slash extension, if you are following some type of provision that goes outside the bounds of those two charts that I showed early on, you need to make a selection here. Even if you have a brand new truck, you need to make a selection here. So uh, the number three and four, uh, three, four and five trucks here, under that column, it says PM filter original equipment. Well, for some trucks right now, they're not required to have 2010 engines. And remember, it's a phase in until 2023. After 2023, everything's gonna have to be 2010 unless you're low use. Until then, there will be trucks that just have filters, but aren't 2010 engines, and they are compliant. In order for the system to see them as compliant, it has to be shown here that they have a PM filter as original equipment. If you don't select that, the system is not gonna see it as compliant, even if it's a brand new truck. So just a couple things there. Um, let's go to the compliance status tab. I've talked about it a few times, but I want to show you what it looks like. This is this is what it looks like for a, a fleet that's having some reporting problems. Uh, if you look here, it lists the name and the trucker's ID and all that good stuff. And then it says a nice red uh, box, not eligible for a certificate. So somehow, some way, somewhere in your reporting, what you've put in there 
does not meet the standard for compliance with this regulation. And before you go digging through it, trying to figure it out, just look right below that. And you might be able to figure it out just looking at that data that's right below. So on this one, this truck has 14 heavy duty trucks. There are diesel trucks. There are 15 trucks reported. Well, if you look back on this slide, down around, let me see where it is. Uh, I can't see it. Um, oh yeah, uh, truck number six, under fuel type, it's listed LPG. So that's liquid petroleum gas. LPG is not diesel. So that truck is actually exempt from this rule. Why they put it in here was maybe to get a credit or something. But because that's reported, it's gonna show up a difference between the diesel trucks and your total trucks reported. That's not how you tell why you didn't get this thing compliant though. If you look down below that, it gives you more information. This one says that two vehicles are claiming extensions. We've got 14 trucks that are subject to being cleaned up. All the diesel trucks are subject to being cleaned up. You, in this case, you have six filters, PM filters towards compliance, and that's not gonna work. Think about this. 14 total trucks, all of them need to have filters. Two of them are claiming extensions. So 14 minus two is 12. In order for this fleet to be compliant, you would also have to have 12 PM filters towards compliance, and this only has six. So automatically, if I'm uh, on a call with somebody, I look at this, I say, yeah, well, that's what it is. We gotta go back and see which one of your vehicles are not showing up as having filtration systems. Anyway, you fix that, and voila, it's gonna, you come back to the compliance status tab, and it doesn't say that you're not eligible anymore, but it doesn't say print your certificate either. It says click to confirm. Well, if you do that, you're getting really close to the end of getting your reporting done. Because what that's gonna do is it's gonna bring up this um, declaration. You have to confirm that what you're putting in our system is true to the best of your knowledge at the time you're reporting it. The reason we have to have you do this is because the lawyers got involved and what they basically said is that if we're not gonna do a visual inspection on every single truck in our system, we have to have any owner tell us that the information they're putting in is true if we ever wanna legally write a citation to somebody we find out in the field that it isn't actually in compliance. So you have to fill this, you have to say okay, and then once you say okay, you close this, and when you, it'll bring you right back to here, where then it will say print certificate. You can click on that button. What it's gonna do is it's gonna bring up a PDF window that shows your certificate. Now this is called a certificate of reported compliance. The only way you can get this certificate is to first of all have a trucker's account with your whole fleet in there, and your fleet be compliant as reported. You also have to have clicked that confirmation uh, and it pops up. So all those things have to be true. You have to be in the, the system, you have to report your fleet, it's gotta be reported compliance, and you have to click that declaration uh, confirmation. When you when this thing pops up and you have this picture on your screen, this PDF picture, you can print it out as many times as you want. All right, it's, it's, you will not be able to save it in any usable form. Uh, if you try to save it, even if you have the full version of Adobe Acrobat, it's gonna give you an error message because we had too many people that saved it and modified it for their friends. So we don't allow that to be saved anymore. Um, in any case, there's something else you need to know about the certificate and that is that we don't use the certificate to determine compliance. So if you think having the certificate is gonna get you out of a, an inspection, a roadside inspection, it's not. You can hand us this. The only thing we're gonna be able to do with this is look you up easier in the reporting system. We're not gonna use it to determine compliance. We're all, this is actually designed specifically for you to be able to demonstrate compliance to somebody who's trying to hire you. That's its only purpose. So remember early on I said for hiring compliant fleets, this is one of the better ways to do it. Well, that's what the certificate is for. All right. You need more information, you can find it here at this website. This is the website for the truck and bus regulation. And it has lots of good links and advisories and rulemaking documents and uh, links to the reporting system, all kinds of good stuff. All right. All right, Katie, before I go any further, were there any truck and bus questions? No, you're all caught up. Okay. 
All right, so um, I'm going to talk briefly about something that's happened recently and it's fairly new, and then Katie's going to take over. So the truck and bus regulation is just part of an overall program that the Air Resources Board has put in place to try and get our air to meet the ambient air quality uh, standards um, set by the federal government for a variety of pollutants. The main pollutants that we're concerned with with regard to these regulations are particulate matter and oxides of nitrogen. The particulate matter is an easy one. It's uh, diesel particulate matter is a toxic, but the NOx one is less obvious, but you should know that it's a major component in the formation of photochemical smog or ozone. So we need to get rid of both these things to have clean air. So the truck and bus is on the pathway that we've put in place to get there. But recently we just passed the first step in the next, I, I don't want to call these the final ones, but they really are the final ones that ARB is probably going to implement major ones anyway. Uh, and there are the three listed here, advanced clean trucks, which I'm going to talk about now, then the Lonox omnibus rule, and then the zero emission fleet rule. So uh, we, we passed the, the advanced clean trucks, and then we also, our board also passed the Lonox omnibus rule. We haven't got to the zero emission fleet rule yet. Let's talk about advanced clean trucks. This does two different things. First of all, it sets manufacturer zero emission vehicle sales requirements of a percentage of their annual sales. Uh, and I'll show you those numbers in just a second. But if you're a manufacturer of heavy duty diesel vehicles, uh, and you sell vehicles, heavy duty vehicles, not diesel ones necessarily, in the state of California, a percentage of your fleet is gonna be mandated to be zero emission all the way out till 2050. The, that's only going to affect manufacturers. The part that's going to affect more people uh, that aren't manufacturers is something called a large entity reporting. And this is a one-time reporting requirement that's going to be mid-2021. If you are under this reporting requirement, you have probably already received notification uh, of, of the uh, in, impending uh, reporting. Uh, we're going to ask for information on the vehicles that you have, the facilities, contracted vehicle services. Uh, all these things are bits of information that we're collecting to try and make decisions on how to implement the zero emission standard. The ZEV requirement for sales is shown here. I'm not going to read through all these, but it begins in 2024, and it's a percentage of your vehicle sales depending on the class size. So the small uh, the small ones, class 2B and 2-3, 5% uh, of the fleet starting in 2024 has to be zero emission vehicle. Uh, and you can see the percentage going on there. Um, these numbers were not just picked out, of, you know, out randomly. These are numbers that coordinate with existing programs and existing numbers that have been put out there to try and get us to the 2045 carbon neutrality goal. That's something that was put out uh, quite some time ago, and this is the, the pathway that we're going to meet. It also aligns very well with several of the ports. Now, San uh, Pedro Bay ports, that's the port of Long Beach and the port of Los Angeles. So uh, they already have programs in place that meet the same kind of standards, and this just kind of goes into that, except it requires it for everywhere else. If, if you don't think you can get there with you know, zero emission vehicles, or if you don't think manufacturers can, well, they are going to be given partial credit for selling plug-in hybrids. Uh, that will diminish over time as technology becomes available. So the one-time reporting is only going to affect those companies that operate facilities in California that have a couple of possibilities. Either they have more 50 or more trucks, or they broker 50 or more trucks, or it's a fleet with greater than $50 million in annual revenue. And probably the big kicker is that all government agencies are going to be required to report. Now, we're asking for the number of vehicles, how they're used. We're going to use this data to see where the ZEVs make, uh, make sense and potential benefits to local communities, what can be gained there, and to hopefully facilitate infrastructure. So one of the biggest issues we have with zero emission vehicle requirements is these things have to be charged. So we have to have electricity. and Right now, we have a problem with infrastructure to provide that electricity. So uh, we need to know where to put it. And this is the way we're gonna figure that out. Other zero emission fleet rules. Uh, so 
I, if you didn't already figure this out, I'm going to just state it straight out. California is headed towards zero emission on, on basically all of our transportation sectors. Will we ever get to full zero emission? Probably not in my lifetime, but uh, we're, we're headed that direction. Frankly, it's one of the only ways we're ever going to be able to meet ambient air quality to or even get close, in my opinion. But this is the steps we're taking. So first, it's going to be drage trucks at ports and rail yards. Those vehicles that um, did, do very small delivery patterns, so last mile delivery is what that's called, and then government fleets. Then later on, we're going to get into the refuse trucks, buses, and utility fleets. And then by 2045, all the rest of the vehicles where it's feasible. This rule focuses, and a lot of them have for some time, focuses on benefits being achieved in what are called disadvantaged communities. I'm not going to give you the long form definition of what that is, but basically it's communities where, where we've got population that cannot get away from the pollution and they're industrialized, so they have more pollution to deal with in the first place. Uh, we're considering all concepts. So green contracting, zero emission zones, purchase requirements, all different things are being required and the data that we're collecting through the reporting system is how we're going to get there. All right, so that's just the primer on advanced clean trucks. I've given you some contact points right here. You've got the uh, web page, the rulemaking documents, the fleet rule web page, and the staff contact person. Uh, Paul, actually, when we're in the office, he's, he's a good guy, he's on our floor. So uh, in any case, that's the advanced clean truck rule. Now, if I don't have any questions, this is where I hand the presentation off to Katie. Katie, do you want to uh, take over? Yeah. Okay. All right. So for the enforcement, we do have enforcement teams that operate throughout California. Um, ARB has two main bases, one in Southern California and one in Sacramento, but we also do have contracts with local air districts to enforce some of our regulations in the San Diego area and in the Central Valley. Um, if you do see on-road inspectors in the field, typically they're working with CHP officers. There are a few ways that CARB identifies non-compliant fleets. The most common is through DMV registration data. So the DMV registration data is now tied to CARB um, compliance. This is really important, so it actually gets its own section in just a minute, but put a pin in that for a moment. Uh, additionally, we conduct random fleet audits where we verify all of the fleet information of a, co of a company or an owner in truckers, which again is the reporting system. We do conduct field inspections. Um, these are most commonly at way stations, distribution centers, truck stops, um, but basically anywhere your vehicle comes to a natural stopping point, you have the potential of being inspected. Uh, per this regulation and the health, California Health and Safety Code, an inspector does have the authority to request to inspect your vehicle. If you deny them right of entry or the right of an inspection, um, you're just, this is again, just as an FYI, you're within your rights to do that, but you will receive a citation for it. And then typically what happens is they obtain a warrant and inspect not only the vehicle they were trying to look at in the first place, but they'll go into your entire facility as well. Um, so if you're trying to avoid a citation, it's most, most likely going to be a lot easier to just let them inspect that vehicle in the first place. Um, additionally, we do receive complaints, particularly regarding uh, smoking vehicles or idling vehicles, and state and local agencies are required to investigate all complaints. So if you do receive a complaint on one of your vehicles, this will lead to an inspection. So what are ARB inspectors looking for? The first thing is excessive smoke. Um, as Randy mentioned earlier, one that we see a lot of issues with is the emission control label. They're also gonna check that anytime that an inspection is going on your vehicle. Um, they look for tampering. So that includes removing emission control equipment or not properly maintaining it. So if you have non-functioning um, DPFs or something like that, then that's an issue as well. Um, illegal use of diesel fuel, 
So that's when you're using red dye diesel, um, which is subject to less taxes and is meant for stationary equipment. If you use that in your on-road vehicle, you're gonna run into some issues there, um, both with enforcement at ARB and also potentially with the IRS because of the issues with the tax evasion. There are two things that will drive an inspection in the field. Um, one is if a vehicle is clearly older. Uh, the second is if the vehicle is smoking. So if an inspector sees an old vehicle, essentially what they're wanting to check is that it's either in compliance with the model year schedule or that it's using a flexibility option and reported in truckers. For smoking vehicles, it's a good indication to inspectors that that vehicle is out of compliance or is having an issue. Um, if a truck has a filter, it shouldn't be smoking. In addition to the truck and bus regulation, we have another regulation to minimize smoke in, um, smoking vehicles, which is the periodic smoke inspection program. This was put into place back in 1998. Inspectors are certified to do a visible emissions evaluation, which means as you're driving by, they typically have a pretty good idea already of what the opacity of the smoke is that's coming out of the exhaust of the truck before it's even pulled over. The opacity is the thickness of the smoke coming out of the exhaust. A higher opacity would ind indicate thicker smoke and uh, more emissions. Once an inspector sees a smoking truck above a certain opacity, they're going to have the CHP pull that truck over to do a heavy duty vehicle inspection for the HD VIP program. They will use a meter that is held to the smokestack to test the opacity of the smoke. This is referred to as a snap acceleration test. A minute ago, I mentioned the Periodic Smoke Inspection Program, or PSIP. Um, PSIP has the same opacity standards or requirements as a SNAP test, but it's an annual test that's required to be conducted by the owner um, if the owner meets the applicability requirements. The old requirements are shown at the bottom of this slide for the opacity, um, but they have been updated and lowered. The reason that we updated these is because the numbers are really outrageously high for filtered trucks. Um, so we'll get into the specifics of the PSIP requirements as far as current smoke. So in order to be subject to PSIP, the fleet um, needs to be California-based, consisting of two or more vehicles with gross vehicle weight ratings of greater than 6,000 pounds. So if you own two or more vehicles, as I just described, you are subject to this regulation. If you only have one vehicle, then you don't meet the requirements. The test is required to be conducted on any vehicle that has an engine model year that's older than four years. So if you have two trucks and one is five years old, the second truck is two years old, you're subject to the regulation. Um, that being said, you are only required to perform the test on the older vehicle, so the five-year-old truck. You don't have to test the newer truck until the engine is four years old. So for example, if the engine is a 2019 engine, you have to start testing it once it reaches four years old in 2022. Um, when you conduct the PSIP tests on the vehicles, they have to meet the updated opacity requirements. Here are some of the recent amendments to on-road regulations. Again, we lowered the opacity limits for both the heavy duty inspection program that's enforced by ARB staff and district staff and the periodic smoke inspection conducted by fleets. We began requiring some training to conduct the PSIP test. Uh, we also opened up a reporting system to allow the submittal of onboard diagnostics in lieu of conducting the PSIP. So this is what the new opacity limits have been lowered to. As you can see, most of the engines that are equipped with DPFs now have to meet an opacity limit of 5%. This is because if your DPF is functioning correctly, it should be emitting less than 1%. A DPF that's operating correctly is certified to remove 99.9% .9 of particulates. Um, so if it's emitting more than about 2%, uh, there's probably an issue like a crack in the filter material of your DPF. Be aware that a lot of the opacity readers, um, they're able to read the lower level of smoke and give you an accurate reading, but unless the software was updated, the pass-fail readout may be incorrect. 
So because the opacity limit is lower, if your software is out of date and you get a 6.5% opacity reading, it may say pass on the meter, but that would actually be a failing result with the new limits. So just double check um, with your meter manufacturer to make sure your software has been updated. Equipment that is not filtered, such as some light duty or heavy duty vehicles that are using a flexibility option, the opacity limit for those are based on their engine model year and a range from 20 to 40%. So there are a couple ways that you can conduct a PSIP test in compliance with the requirements. If you contract somebody to do the testing for you, that typically runs in the $50 to $150 range per test per vehicle. In order for somebody to provide PSIP tests as a contracted service, they have to have undergone the HDVIP um, PSIP training course at the California Council on Diesel Education and Technology. That certification is a one-day training course and it needs to be renewed every four years. Please be sure that if you contract someone to do this test for you that their certification is valid. They also need to enter their certification number into the opacity meter in order for it to be a valid test. We have been getting a lot of questions recently from attendees on whether these courses are still being offered with the current COVID situation and the answer is yes. There are online courses being offered at, um, for the CC debt certification. If you go to the CC debt site, you can find specifics on their class schedule page. A second option is for someone inside your company to conduct the test. This is the direct fleet employee option. In that scenario, you or your employee does not need to attend um, the CC debt course. The only training required is the CARB training uh, MS 529. This is a free course and the training needs to complete any option available to contracted smoke testers. After completion of the course, you'll be emailed a copy of your certificate and a tester number. Again, you need to enter that number into the opacity meter when you conduct a test in order for it to be valid. So this regulation, again, is being enforced at the state and local level. As with any rule, the reason that we enforce it is to create a level playing field among fleet owners. If we have a rule that's not enforced, um, people who are complying with it of their own choice are at a disadvantage for investing in cleaning up their fleets. Currently, the big focus for enforcement is SB1, which started in 2017. This legislation tied vehicle registration to compliance with the truck and bus regulation. We've had the authority to hold registrations for years, but this was the first implementation of actually doing so. So we'll get into a little more detail on SB1. So SB1 stands for Senate Bill 1. A lot of people know it as the gas tax. I'm sure that everyone who's driven on the highways recently has seen the road repair sign saying your SB1 dollars at work. Um, the long name for the bill was actually the Road Repair and Accountability Act. So the road repair part is pretty obvious, but the accountability side is actually what's applicable to this regulation. And it um, refers to the effects on owner operators of vehicles that fall under the scope of the truck and bus regulation. So vehicles need to be in compliance with the truck and bus regulation in order to register the vehicle with DMV. If you have an engine model year that needs to be reported in our system, if it's not reported or and using a compliance option um, or reported to have a filter or reported to have upgraded the engine, then your vehicle registration will be held by DMV and you will be unable to register your vehicle until you rectify the compliance issues in truckers. So our regulation is based on engine model year, but because DMV doesn't have access to engine information, their registration holds are based on the chassis model year. Um, something to note with that is they will assume that your engine model year is one year older than the chassis model year that's reported in the system. If you do happen to have an engine model year that's the same as your chassis model year, you can report that into the um, excluded diesel vehicle reporting system that Randy had talked about earlier, and that should um, exclude you from having issues with DMV. By 2023, the only way to register your vehicle will be if it's a 2010 engine 
or is reported as low use or NOx exempt. So what if you don't have a 2011 or newer vehicle? Um, remember again, when I say 2011 vehicle, it's because the engine is typically one year older. So what if I don't have a 2010 engine? If you have a 2010 or newer engine, you won't see any of these, um, any of this happening. If you don't, you need to either use the re reporting system or repower the vehicle. So remember, DMV has access to truckers. So if your engine is beyond the model year schedule and you haven't reported using a flexibility option, they will hold your registration. If you are reported correctly, there should be no issue with registration holds. Here's some of the contact information if you do have additional questions on this information. The 866 diesel line is staffed five days a week and we also have an email that goes to that staff if you have reporting or compliance questions. Um, if you do have some sort of hold on your account, it's normally better to use that truckers email that Randy provided earlier. So now we'll get into um, tractor trailer greenhouse gas or GHG. This regulation was passed in 2008 and implemented in 2010. So we're now over a decade into this regulation. Um, it's a bit unique in that it doesn't have anything directly to do with the emission source or the engine of the vehicle. It requires owners and operators of specific types of vehicles to reduce their fuel consumption by making the vehicles more aerodynamic. It's based on a program that was started at the federal level called SmartWay. SmartWay is a program that certifies certain equipment made by manufacturers that make vehicles more aerodynamic and fuel efficient and therefore use less fuel. If you see trucks on the highway with the flaps below the trailer, um, you're seeing trucks using this program. So if you, you can see um, vehicles getting more aerodynamically efficient and burning less fuel using this program. If a vehicle has perfect combustion, it should be emitting carbon dioxide, water, and nitrogen gas. Those were initially not thought to be pollutants, but because of the greenhouse gas, is gas issue, we now know that these emissions are causing a problem. Because of the byproducts of efficient combustion, we can't prevent them altogether which is why we try to limit the amount of fuel combusted in the first place. And that's why this regulation is in place. So who must comply um, with the GHG regulation? Anyone with a 53 foot or longer box type trailer operating in California, anyone that owns, drives, leases, rents, sells, or even as a broker dispatcher for this type of vehicle is also required to comply with the GHG regulation. This applies to the trailer and the tractor that pulls them. Um, the vehicles are required to use SmartWay verified technologies and the installation of low rolling resistance or LRR tires. These are tires that meet aerodynamic guidelines to provide less resistance with the road and therefore increase fuel efficiency. The general regulation phase in schedule deadlines have already passed. So we're looking at a history of when these requirements were completed. It was phased in by model year, but again, you had to add various technologies to get their fuel efficiency to increase by a minimum of 5% and institute the use of low rolling resistance tires. If you had a refrigerated dry van, you also only had to go 4% with the fuel savings. Um, and again, the rolling resistance tires, low rolling resistance tires. You may or may not have seen a lot of enforcement with the specific regard to this rule because um, it actually works and the fuel cost savings typically outweigh the initial upfront cost of installing the equipment. So because people are saving money using these te technologies, it's not very hard for us to get compliance with this particular regulation. Um, when you're driving on the highway, almost every truck you see will have at least one of these technologies installed. Uh, the wings that we saw at the beginning provide a 5% improvement on the non-refrigerated trailers. You'll see those on a majority of trucks. Um, you'll also see the box flaps on the back of the trailer, and those provide a 2 to 3% increase in fuel efficiency. There are a couple ways that you can get out of the requirements of this regulation. 
They're called the local haul and short haul tractors. Local haul travel only within a 100 mile radius of their home base and short haul tractor is any tractor that drives less than 50,000 miles per year. If you are a local haul tractor trailer, then you have no requirements under this regulation. If you are a short, uh, short haul tractor, then your only requirement is the low rolling resistance tires. In order to exercise easy, either of these options, you do have to report and there is a reporting system for this regulation. So we'll talk about some of the clean transportation and energy saving product uh, projects. This is basically our incentive programs. So we have the hybrid, um, oh, disclaimer before I start with this. We'll, I'll go into the funding programs, but because funding information is constantly changing and a lot of times is also run through local air districts, um, for the most up-to-date information, you should contact your local air district directly. Nearly all of the funding programs are implemented through the local air districts. So one of those programs is the hybrid and zero emission voucher incentive program. This program's funding is determined by the legislature, so it changes every year. Um, obviously, again, a lot of these programs received less funding this year due to the budget situation that was caused by COVID. The HVIP program is designed to try to get alternate technology, um, non-combustion type vehicles into your fleets and into the markets. There are thousands of new alternative fuel technology vehicles coming out, um, thousands of projects that are being worked on right now, and lots of money being invested into those type of technologies by both businesses and funding programs. In this program, a voucher is provided to cover part of the vehicle purchase for those type of vehicles. This program is run through your local air district, and a lot of times the dealerships have information on this as well, so you can always ask your local dealership about it. The Truck Loan Assistance Program is not a local district, uh, district program. This is run through the State of California Air Resources Board. The main difference between this and the other funding programs is that the money is available for fleets that are not currently in compliance. For almost all of the funding programs, your fleet needs to be in compliance already to be eligible. If your fleet is not in compliance, if you have open violations, or even if you're going to be out of compliance very soon, so if you have a compliance deadline coming up, you may not be eligible for funds with some of the other funding programs. The reason for that is that public funds are not available to pay for compliance. They are available to make improvements to air quality that may not have been made otherwise. If you're out of compliance or going out of compliance, that's an upgrade that would have been made anyway. The shortest amount of time, well, I've actually recently updated this. So there is the farmer program. If you do have an ag vehicle, um, if you even if you have less than a year up till your compliance deadline for certain areas, you may still be eligible for funding. Um, so I saw that for the Placer pool, which covers a few districts. A lot of the smaller air districts go through there. Um, but a lot of times they want you to have at least a year Prior, uh, before your next compliance date in order to be eligible for funding. For the truck loan assistance program, again, this doesn't require you to be in compliance for funds. Um, so you can be out of compliance. It doesn't matter when your compliance deadline is. Uh, that being said, this program is not a grant, it's a loan. So it's built to provide funding for businesses that may not have been eligible to get a loan otherwise. Uh, in this scenario, the state of California is essentially co-signing your loan. And if you do need loan assistance to get into a newer vehicle, it's a very helpful avenue for a lot of people. This is another program where your fleet needs to be compliant to be eligible. It's allocated to smaller fleets with 10 or fewer vehicles, and the vehicles must be mainly operated in California over the last two years. It's not typical um, for more than 50 to 60% of the cost of the new truck to be covered under this program, the voucher incentive program. Contact your local dealer and or, and or your local air district to see if you're eligible for these funds or if funding is currently available. If you do need more information on incentives and loans, we have websites here that are you know, constantly updated. They're gonna be more up to date than the information that we can relay to you. 
You can also join our listserv, which sends out automatic emails for public workshops, upcoming regulations, upcoming funds, and upcoming trainings. It's a great way to stay in the loop and you can opt out at any time. Additionally, we added a couple contacts here for you to find out about our program. So we have Amberine and Violet if you want direct contact information at ARB. If you do have any questions about the truck and bus regulation, we have the diesel hotline available and the diesel hotline email. If your questions are more complex, so like I said, if you've already been held up with an issue with either DMV or with our um, being on hold with trucker staff, then you should contact truckers directly at the email on the screen rather than the diesel hotline. We also have the Truck Stop website, which Randy talked about. It shows our upcoming trainings and has some great resources like the fact sheets. Um, this is the last slide for today, so I want to thank everyone for attending, and we will open it up to questions for a few minutes and then wrap up the webinar. Randy, I'll pass it back to you for the timer. All right. All right, so when the uh, screen gets to uh, zero on this, we're going to be closing out the webinars. If you have questions, now's the time to ask before we get uh, off air. All right, we had a request to recap the PSIP class requirements. I Do you mean the just each requirement for each, um, like individuals internally and externally for that? So the class requirements are really only for those people that are doing the tests themselves. She said how to find the class. So I'll go ahead and put the, um, for CCDAT, I'll put their information into the question dialog box, and then if anybody wants that, they can um, just get it from there. All right. And then if you did want somebody internally, like inside your fleet to conduct it, then it's on our webpage for that. But I put the CC debt one into the chat. Good deal. Okay, we have a question. How are boom lifts or cherry pickers regulated? Yeah, boom lifts or cherry picker, um, the majority of those, as I understand it, are single engine vehicles that use a power takeoff device to run the boom or the lift. Uh, if that is the case for the vehicle you're talking about, that falls under the truck and bus rule exactly the way we discussed. Unless it's an, a public agency vehicle, then it falls under the public agency and utility regulation. If the boom lift happen, happens to have a two-engine setup where it has one engine to drive the vehicle and another one to operate the boom and or lift, 
uh, then that vehicle and the secondary engine would fall under the off-road diesel vehicle regulation uh, because it was built that way from the factory. So that's a very good question. It's going to be a really fairly complicated one and actually impossible for me to answer until I know whether or not it's a power takeoff setup or a two-engine setup. Yeah, and some of the boom lifts are aerial lifts and they have off-road engines exclusively. So if yeah. your first step would be just looking at the emission control label on the engine and seeing what it's certified to. And then the only way it gets really complicated is if it's two engines. But otherwise it's gonna be what it's certified to. Yeah.
All right, Katie, it looks like um, our time is up for today. We've still got 33 people online. You didn't have any additional questions? No, nothing came in. All right, everybody, I appreciate the time. Remember, there will be a recording of this available in probably a couple of hours. Uh, but for now, have a nice afternoon.